Hello everyone, welcome back to the EdTech podcast and this series of the VocTech podcast learning continues. A big shout out to UFI VocTech Trust who support this series and don't forget that UFI's seed grant fund call is now open. So if you've got a big idea using digital to transform how people gain skills for work, then check out the website at ufi.co.uk. The grant window is open until the 9th of February and ranges from grants of £15,000 to £50,000. This is our first episode of 2022, so a belated Happy New Year to you all. And thank you again for listening into our podcast, which is six this year. I'm looking forward to recording lots of fantastic new episodes to share with you. This week, we've got the excellent James Plunkett on the podcast. We're asking the big questions and thinking about the challenges of upskilling in an atomised gig economy. What's your path from being an Uber driver to being an Uber coder? How do you get training to those who need it most? Yeah, the, the robots don't take the jobs, they change them. And how do you resolve the complexities of the current systems? There was a boldness in that and a simplicity in that offer of a free education for adults um, that is just missing from this kind of you know, incrementalist kind of tweaks that we, that we tend to use talking about adult education today. In his book, End State, James says, as the 21st century progresses, the paucity of our approach to adult skills risks creating an economic and social emergency. The good news is James is optimistic about our ability to come up with bold solutions. So listen in to find out more. What else? Dear listeners, I'm also excited to share that along with the podcast and after nearly six years of podcasting, I'm starting a new venture this year, which is dedicated to humanising hybrid work and spreading opportunity in the knowledge economy. Things are all very early stage and exciting, but as things develop, I'll be sharing any major updates with you here. And if you're a technical whiz and love building prototypes, then do get in touch. This year is all about pilot testing. And I'm available at sophie.bailey, B-A-I-L-E-Y, at worktrip, T-R-I-P-P dot com. So without further ado, let's get straight into it. Here's James kicking off our first podcast of 2022. Okay, so I am very excited and very happy because we have uh, James Plunkett, who is the author of End State, Nine Ways Society is Broken and How We Will Fix It, uh, on this week's episode. So welcome, James. Welcome. I think this this episode has been uh, in the making for a number of months. The backdrop to reaching out was that my um, husband actually had your book. I think he'd uh, been recommended it and he was sort of saying, oh, you know, there's loads of chapters in here about lifelong learning and uh, you should definitely get him on your podcast. So then I spent uh, part of Christmas or binge reading the whole book and absolutely loved it. So um, I am really excited about getting into the details as well yeah great to hear look forward to talking about it (laughs) so um for our listeners a little bit of background before we begin um james is also the executive director for design data and technology at citizens advice and he has also held various roles across the resolution foundation the young foundation and the center for data and ethics and innovation Um, A quick bio, James has worked for over a decade at the heart of public policy, exploring how to solve society's thorniest problems. In the late 2000s, he was working at 10 Downing Street when the full scale of the digital revolution started to make itself felt. He has since spent 10 years grappling with the social ramifications of economic changes from leading influential studies into the gig economy and prosperity to overseeing policy and technology teams in the charity sector. Optimistic and curious about the future, he shows how, even in difficult times, we can make society richer, fairer and happier. And he can also be found on Twitter at James T. Plunkett with uh, two T's at the end. So, James, to kick off, one thing that really struck me with the book is uh, a scene in the beginning where you are at a meeting um, rather surreally uh, with Gordon Brown and Tim Berners-Lee. 
So um, I wondered if you could describe the significance of this meeting and what it represented at a sort of symbolic level and the implications for whether our existing systems uh, are fit for purpose. Yeah, sure. I mean, it was um, one of those surreal, slightly surreal moments, as you say, So, because at working in number 10s, often you get these odd moments where you find yourself sort of sitting with sitting with people you might not have expected. And this one was um, a meeting with, with, as you say, Gordon Brown and Tim Berners-Lee, who's sort of the man, I guess, credited with having invented the internet, if that can, if that, if that can be a thing. Um, and it was one of those last minute things, kind of called into the meeting, someone sent around an email saying kind of who can join this. And so we sat, um, oddly, we sat in the number 10 garden because it was a nice day. So we sat on these kind of wicker chairs um, in the garden. And um, yeah, and it was a meeting to discuss kind of how the government um, approaches technology policy and data policy. Um, and the kind of, I guess, the substance of the meeting sort of faded from memory quite quickly. But the, um, the thing that stuck with me and I guess sort of lodged the, the sort of seed that, that then grew into the book um, was the kind of contrast between, between the two of them. Um, and I really remember this conversation between, between, between Brown and, and Berners-Lee where... So Gordon Brown was talking in the language, I guess, of, of, of the government of the 20th century state, you know, the kind of the big clunking fist of the state, um, asking sort of questions about, you know, what, what levers can we pull as the government? Um, what can we do with tax? I think at one point he said, how can we beat the Americans on this agenda? Um, and Tim Berners-Lee, for anyone who kind of has seen him speak, speaks in this kind of completely yeah. different language. So he kind of, A, he sort of buzzes around all over the place. Um <laughs> But B, his kind of um, the words he uses and the kind of logic with which he speaks is all about networks. It's about platforms. It's about standards, um, and it's it's sort of the logic of the internet. Essentially, it's the logic of the internet economy, um, and that yeah, I was left with. So I, I, talk, I say this in the book, kind of feeling of unease at that contrast of you know the the government just felt like it worked to a different logic to this new economy that was emerging, and it and it felt like that would. I sort of didn't realise at the time how problematic that would be. But over the subsequent 10 years, I guess I've started to think that that's kind of quite a good metaphor, if you like, for the problem that we face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It it made me think of a couple of things. So one was that I used to work in technology events that would intersect with different uh, industry sectors. So things like at the time, it was sort of mobile healthcare or mobile banking. And it was exactly as you just described. So you had the sort of fast pace and agile methodology of of, um, the internet and, and developers. And then the sort of cautious or more um committee based um systems thinking or of of um sort of traditional industry sectors essentially so um uh you know it was never as exciting as Gordon Brown and Tim Berners Lee in the same room but um I, I definitely um could connect with that idea of sort of cultures clashing yeah. and it and it also made me think of that sort of famous uh meeting or interrogation of Mark Zuckerberg by sort of some of the senators and, and perhaps that the, you know their lack of the language necessary to sort of interrogate some of the the more questionable facets of big technology. So um, yeah, yeah, I was yeah. I was thinking about what that would mean as well when we think about um, for this podcast, sort of adult education and um, you know making sure that we are equipping our citizens with the tools they need to be successful and happy in 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 the economy that we find ourselves in now and in and in, in the world that we find ourselves in now as well. Yeah, I, I just think this that sort of mismatch comes up again and again, and as you, as you say, it's partly just um, a basic question of skills. So I mean, certainly if you look at um, politicians and MPs today, um, there's not an understanding of technology and there's almost that, that sense of speaking a different language um, when they kind of come up against these these tech giants. Um, but as you say, it's also just the, the kind of the systems and the policy settlements in um, education I look at in the book, um, the welfare system and the way the welfare system doesn't work with kind of gig economy jobs, for example. The fact that just the way we think about education is not ready for for digital jobs and for the way that the kind of the skills the labor market needs these days yeah i mean we should definitely talk about that because there's 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 so many ideas in there that i want to get into but i suppose yeah one of the big things that leapt out at me was this idea that 
you know, we talk quite often about automation and the effect this has on jobs. And quite often that's pitched as, uh, you know, robots are going to take your jobs, whereas the reality is, is, is slightly more subtle in that it's more a slicing and dicing of parts of your jobs. And so I think you describe it as like a crumbling staircase or automation nibbling away at jobs. And so, you know, perhaps where you were doing sort of an end to end piece, you end up just doing, you know, one out of 10 of those different skill sets. So something that that made me think about was, you know, how you retain your kind of self-worth and also value as an employee and as a a sort of learner within the workplace. So, um, you know, something that was quite dispiriting was the idea that um, in the sort of lower paid end of the market, there are three main areas. So um, I think you describe them as caring roles, last mile workers and wealth workers. And wealth workers being this huge, huge part of the economy, which just is just about servicing, um, you know, uh, the sort of wealthy end of the market. So, for example, a delivery driver that's rocking up at someone's desk and delivering them a single crepe because that's what they've sort of demanded and that, that that's what they're able to order. And, and whether that's the best use of our kind of technology and, and our collective human intelligence. So, yeah, some really interesting challenges, I think. Yeah, and I think, as you say, the, like the public debate about this kind of the robots question, it always it always mm. gets reduced down to the sort of unemployment fear, as you say, and kind of, will there be mass unemployment? And I, which I basically think is is a sort of nonsense. It's such a recurring fear throughout history, kind of here, here comes mass unemployment because of automation. Um, and as you say, what happens is instead of that, you know, the, the robots don't take the jobs, they change them. Um, mm. and one of the lines in the book, and um, there's an example of... Um, a translator that I talk about in, in the book who's who doesn't actually lose her job but um she ends up having to check translations that are done by algorithms so rather than doing sort of high highly skilled work gets kind of downgraded and devalued I guess to some degree gets paid less is expected to do more translation in the same amount of time mm-hmm. um, and as you say I mean the, the, the big fear I guess that labor market economists have is you get what they call polarization where you get Therefore, sort of lots of jobs at the top for people who are writing those algorithms and the, the software engineers and designers. But then, then, as you say, you get these jobs at the bottom, which are kind of caring jobs, um, uh, wealth jobs, sort of serving the rich. Um, and the other category I kind of find quite dystopian is what they call these last last mile jobs, which are um, almost kind of picking up after the machines. So it's kind of <laughs> warehouse operatives that need to pick up parcels that machines can't pick up or um, chat room moderators uh, for when the chat for when the chat bot can't work out what someone's saying um, and it's kind of just got slightly sort of depressing you know, risk the risk that we end up with this very polarized labor market and then I guess a very polarized society as a result of that yeah and I think one of the things that I also loved about your book though is that you don't kind of um just collapse into a, a sort of despair and that you know through your approach which is very much looking back at historical examples to inform why our approach should be optimistic and bold um you know you, you underline the importance of retaining hope because actually instead of us being at the equivalent of the fall of the Roman Empire. You, you think that we're actually in this sort of transition phase and there's there's a great emphasis on hope. So you've put hope isn't just nice, it's a vital ingredient if we're going to pull off the transition to a digital economy. So yeah, what kind of gives you that um, that hope and optimism? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I am very optimistic. And then, well, and I actually didn't expect that starting out <laughs> writing the book, the kind of anticipated obviously I was going to write about these big problems and I had a hunch kind of what might be behind them um but the thing that made me optimistic really was was the long-term history um because you know we've been through something very similar before um in the industrial revolution um and I was so struck when I started reading about that history how similar the kind of vibe was um Mm. and this kind of sense of um the in-tray kind of mounting up with problems that we hadn't worked out how to solve. Obviously, at the time, the problems were quite sort of um, tangible. So kind of, you know, sewage mounting up on the banks of the River Thames, um, terrible illnesses like cholera and diphtheria, um, uh, child labour, and the kind of terrible situation where kids in factories were being maimed by 
machines. And um, and at the time, it, there was this kind of obviously very hot politics that came out of all of that and, and re- revolution and um, uprisings. And um, uh, in the end, we <laughs> we got through it in the sense that in all of those cases, we found ways to solve those problems, really. I mean, we, you know, for example, we established modern sewage systems and water treatment plants. Um, we passed labour laws to stop child labour. Um, and so as difficult as it seemed, we kind of, we got through that technological revolution and we sort of came out the other end with a, a very different government that was able to um, to sort of manage that new economy. And it strikes me that that's that's very similar to where, where we're at now. And I, I guess um, I sort of say it's not the end, it's an ending. So we're sort of, we're coming to the end of one era. Um, and the question is, what does government look like as we move into the next era? I, I like this quote here as well. I've got from um, from Keynes in, in 1925. It says, um, when we're discussing the ideal future state of society, so the quote is, this has to be tackled in the first instance from the ethical side rather than, than from the standpoint of technical economic efficiency. So, um You know, I I think even the pandemic and the amount of money that was corralled to problem solve and the amount of um, agility in some of our larger institutions that were, um, you know, kicked into action shows that, you know, we, 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 we can sort of push beyond the bare minimum as well. So I think this has interesting uh, ramifications when we're thinking about, you know, optimism and actually sort of shaping what we want from our sort of educational systems as well yeah yeah and I think we've got into this slightly um incrementalist sort of te- technocratic hmm. way of thinking about politics um and I talk about sort of like the war of the charts where kind of you know every policy is analyzed on the basis of its distributional impacts and the kind of endless chart wars of kind of you know who will this help who will who will lose out um as a result of this incremental tweak to benefits or taxes um and I guess one thing I say in the book is we didn't we didn't ban child labour on the basis of a cost benefit analysis. Um, yeah. You know, we kind of we led with the ethics and we said this 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 is wrong. This must not happen. And um, this must be banned. And let's work through the right way. So we sort of, we led with the ethics and then we came in with kind of what's what's the policy that that makes that possible. Um, and I think there's there's interesting analogies with a policy like the living wage, which is very much in that space. It starts with you know, ethical premise of saying people should earn enough. If someone's working full time, they should earn enough to live a decent life. Um, and then it works through how do you make that happen? Um, so I sort of think we're missing, we've got a bit obsessed with economic efficiency um, and the sort of the, the chart wars. Um, and we need to bring back, bring back ethics when we're having some of these debates. Absolutely. And then moving into sort of adult education, um, one thing that I found quite interesting is when you're looking back at recent history and actually crisis points being a, a real opportunity in terms of thinking about what education or what skills development or um, package of policy and funding and um, training or, or, or sort of education is needed to sort of support the the new version of society going forward. So I was really interested to read about the UK Ministry of Reconstruction's landmark 1919 report on adult education, um, which argued that adult education is a permanent national necessity on insurable aspect of citizenship. And, uh, you know, we, we had innovations around um, later on around the University of the Air and Open University and that kind of thing. Um, but it seems like adult education has always been shadowed by this sense that education is, you know, the school age group and that after that there's a lot of rhetoric, but perhaps it isn't always backed up by by funding. Um, so I'd love to share with our listeners what you found around adult education to make it sort of fit for purpose in this sort of digital economy as well. Yeah, um, I think it's, yeah, there's a, there's a huge gap between the rhetoric over the years. And so many governments have said, you know, adult education must be a priority. But as you say, really, when you dig into it, all our metaphors of education are all about sort of um, preparing kids for life. And it's all about sort of set, laying the foundations, preparing children for life. And it's this very strongly implicit is that education is something you do when you're young to kind of get you ready for life. And then, you, then you're kind of off on your way. Um, and it's and it's really striking. I spoke to a lot of experts in adult skills and they were all a bit depressed and kind mm. of all the charts moving in the wrong direction. 
um, so many things tried um, over the years. Employers, we basically rely on employers to do sort of much of the adult training and they under under invest and also they tend to invest in people that already have the best skills because mm-hmm. that's sort of where they get the best return. Um, so it's sort of on, in one sense a bit of a depressing story but then I came across um, this story about the GI Bill um, that I'm sure some listeners will, will know about of kind of in America um, in response to the Second World War then there was this kind of absolute fear of what would happen when the soldiers when the veterans returned home from the war after being uh, decommissioned Um, and a real fear about kind of public disorder and where would all these returning soldiers go would there be jobs for them Um, and there was this kind of in hindsight incredibly bold offer made to basically give a free education to any any of these returning soldiers Um, and I talk about this in the book and it's quite quite moving actually to read about um, this massive uptake. So there was this just massively higher than expected uptake of this offer of a free education um, and all these returning soldiers in, in America in 1945 um, uh, went to university for free and you know, places like Harvard and like some of the real elite universities doubled their enrollment figures and packed out with soldiers, you know, changing the culture of these places overnight. Um, and and people think it had this massive impact on the American economy because it equipped um, this huge tranche of, of young people, mostly young men, to be honest, um, with the skills that America needed for that for that next generation. And I think there's just a kind of, there was a boldness in that and a simplicity in that offer of a free education for adults um, that is just missing from this kind of you know, incrementalist kind of tweaks that we that we hmm. tend to use talking about adult education today. Yeah, absolutely. I've got the page open because um, there's this fantastic sentence here. It's uh, the GI Bill funded the education of 22,000 dentists, 67,000 doctors, 91,000 scientists, 238,000 teachers, 240,000 accountants and 450,000 engineers, as well as three Supreme Court judges, three presidents, amazing a dozen senators 14 nobel prize winners and two dozen um, pulitzer prize winners which is like quite astonishing isn't it it's just amazing and i just i just think there's something about um it's just also in, it's that you know one of the problems with adult education i think is no one understands it you know even when you speak to the experts um they describe it as the kind of um a labyrinth you, you don't quite know what you're entitled to um mm-hmm. it's complex to claim entitlements and so governments cut it frankly because no one notices um so they get away with cutting it um much like they get away with cutting the complicated welfare system um and so you know that's such a contrast with the gi bill which was this really clear emphatic offer of we will fund a free education for any returning soldier and i just think there's a there's such an interesting opportunity post covid to say you know we're going to do something big and bold when it comes to to free digital skills and for people after this after the pandemic yeah I remember that point very much about uh, in all of your chapters that you know if if you make the thing too too personalized too complex difficult to navigate it falls by the wayside so it it, there's 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 a beauty in in just a simple offer which people sort of um, intuitively understand as well yeah I completely agree and I, I think um you know when you think about the NHS as, as complex as it is under the under the skin, um, you know it is free healthcare. You 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 know that very simple point that your healthcare will be free, and likewise something like the minimum wage just says you will be paid more than this amount. Um, and they're popular those policies, and they last, and they mm. have that kind of appeal. Um, and if you contrast them with adult skills or welfare, is another obvious example. Um, you know, labyrinth labyrinthine, complex, stigmatizing targeted um and those those are the policies that tend to get cut and sort of erode over time and you kind of contrast the gi bill success with this example of um nathaniel i think his name is who sort of went from construction and then the pandemic hit and then he ended up in a load paid cashier job to sort of pay the bills but ultimately wants to retrain but doesn't have that bold policy to kind of grab onto so all of this was making me think about you know, what are the options if you are part of that growing gig economy? Um, 
you know, or, or your Nathaniel sat at the, the cashier job thinking, well, you know, how, what is my pathway out of this? Mm-hmm. Did you have any in your research, any kind of reasons for optimism, for innovations to help those people that are outside of the training that always goes to the same people? Yeah, I, mean, I think it is to some degree it's harder than it used to be because and this is the point about um, polarisation, that they sometimes call it hollowing out, um, mm. where you get you know, the kind of simple way of thinking about it, I guess, is in the past, you, you might have a company where you could progress up through the, through the, through the levels from being um, in an admin role to being a manager, and you might work in the same office as your boss. And, and now you have a company like Uber, where you've got some software engineers out in California or wherever Uber's based, um, and then you've got Uber drivers. And... It, what's your path from being an Uber driver to being an Uber coder? Um, and you get this kind of missing rungs on the ladder. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I think I, I really remember speaking to speaking to Nathaniel because he he was just kind of so smart and dedicated, and he'd already started doing some training around around this, but he just couldn't take the risk of um, of kind of quitting his job. I think. We know from the evidence he probably should take that risk because the returns are pretty good actually if you if you do take the risk but it's completely understandable that people don't um and so i think there's um there's kind of promising stuff around some of the new providers in this space there's obviously a lot of innovation around kind of quick quick courses to retrain as an engineer or as a yeah software as a designer um really impressive wage returns on some of those courses um but I, I do think you have to have the government come in behind to give that kind of security and confidence to people who understandably are trying to put food on the table for their kids and aren't up for taking a big risk. Um, you know, and, and it's good for the economy, as I said, with the GI Bill. It's, it it ret- gives the government a return as well as the individual. And I think there was that example. I think, you know, you are seeing more sort of learning wallets. So putting the putting the um, the agency into the individual learners hand so things like the a thousand dollars for adult training in Singapore and I know that other countries are kind of exploring that as well yeah yeah absolutely I think I think that point about letting the person choose because the other I guess policy approach that hasn't really worked in the past and this was kind of the approach when I was in government was um sort of uh, forecasting what skills we might need and trying to set these very sort of top-down targets um Whereas the GI Bill was interesting, they didn't. They just let hmm. people choose what course they 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 went with, and actually, people made pretty damn good choices um, about their futures. So I think there's a kind of combination of kind of keeping it simple and and clear and bold and ambitious, but with giving people some freedom about about what they want to do with their lives. Absolutely. You talk about this sort of quite famous behavioral economics department so that like what is often referred to as the nudge department and you know um sort of senior members within within that department which were all you know culturally speaking was already slightly um uh, separate from perhaps the the mainstay of politics that we talked about in the beginning um but f- effectively trying to educate internally around the gov platform so um you know building a user-led uh, digital platform which is uh, good for citizens takes away the complexity that we talked about earlier but actually disrupts loads of internal systems and channels and in and instead ask for you know cross-departmental working and things like that and this will be um, something that anyone listening will absolutely relate to, but that that kind of <laughs> banging of heads against walls sometimes. And what I loved about your your story here was that in any of these areas that you're talking about, um, sometimes we feel like we're not getting anywhere, but quite often the ingredients for change are already visible are already there. So if we talk about things like the universal basic income, which has sort of gained traction, and then actually during the pandemic, we see something that's not that dissimilar to it. And, you know, you would never have predicted that. But anyway, these 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 kind of ingredients are on the table, but that it may take 10 years, 20 years, and and actually that's okay. And there is value in just keeping going if if you if you can stay sane through that process, whether that's digital transformation or just more generally speaking, change management. But I'd love to, you to to share um the main 
um, ideas in that chapter because I just I just thought that was great and I, and I think anyone should go out and buy the book and and read it if they operate in a in a department where they're trying to be that person to push push the change to happen as well. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I actually ended up I dedicated the book <laughs> at the end to people who spend every day running into the wind. And this <laughs> yeah, I remember that bit. It was a phrase that came out of um, it's funny I was reading a a report on civil service reform from the 1950s I think it was and um yeah this kind of person said actually there's impressive work being done but if only if, if only people could kind of just pause the work for a minute and step back and look at the big picture um mm. and uh, also kind of there was a nice history of of Victorian reformers and this kind of amazing generation of civil servants in the um in the in the kind of late 1800s um who were trying to change government in response to the industrial revolution um, and they were they were said to be running into the wind every day and kind of desperately trying, desperately trying to reform the civil service so that it could work for a new world. And it just felt so familiar to people working in digital teams in government today, where sort of every day can feel like running into the wind, um, where you're kind of arguing it's back to the, the Tim Berners Lee Gordon Brown sort of contrast that you you get. Um, conversation after conversation where you're basically having a kind of clash of paradigms and um, a clash of worldviews and people are trying to sort of um, to work out how does government need to function in this new in this new world that we're now living in um, and the kind of existing processes and behaviors and structures um, just don't really work so you know I mentioned things like the Whitehall department which is a kind of you know, a very hierarchical, sort of top-down, bureaucratic um, institution, very siloed. Um, that's kind of the opposite of of what you need in a digital in a digital world, um, and it's kind of completely the opposite of how maybe a tech startup might work, which will be you know much more agile, much more much flatter, uh, much more autonomy for individual teams. Um, and if you're kind of, I guess, if you're one of the people that's sort of arguing for that kind of change and that new way of working. Um, it feels like a slog. I, I use the um, metaphor of kind of it's a bit like digging up um, digging up a tree, and you don't quite realise how deep the roots are going to go. And every time you dig a bit deeper, you realise the kind of it's even more embedded than you thought it was, and you have to dig again and dig again. And this sense of kind of <laughs> not making much progress, but I guess that kind of to finish on the the point of optimism, it's it is when you zoom out and you look over. 10 years or 20 years or even 50 years, you see this really quite extraordinary, extraordinary change and kind of government looking unrecognisably different, you know, in, in 1900 compared to how it looked in 1850. Um, and no doubt government will look unrecognisable in 2050 compared to how it looked in 2000. But kind of only if we keep, only if we keep running into the wind, I guess, is the, is the point. That's brilliant. And and since you wrote the book, have you, I, I can't remember that French expression of when you're on the staircase and you think of something good to say in, in re retaliation to someone, but it's a sort of a similar idea. Since you've published, are there any other points that you think, oh, I would have loved to include that? You know, do you have the the um, the kernels of perhaps a second book in there at all? Yeah, <laughs> um, I think... Um... I don't know. I'm, I'm I'm very interested in this question of um, what will the government need to look like, and I use, I can say that the government, not just the central state, but what what will kind of what kind of institutions do we need um, by say 2050? Um, and I'm just fascinated by that question because they will be, as I say, they will be unrecognisably different. So you know, the welfare system will need to be unrecognisably different. Um, education will need to be different. Um, healthcare and public health will need to be different to what we're used to. And um, so that question of kind of what will come next um, uh, is, is just fascinating, I think. And I, I sort of, I talk about that a bit throughout the book, but I'm quite interested in exploring that question um, a bit more. Um, I think the main thing is um, it's been nice that in some ways, some of the optimism, although things feel a bit bleak <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> I think, um, you know, there's real momentum behind some of these debates. So an example is the four day week that I talk about in yep. one chapter of the book as kind of a solution to burnout and the sort of digital burnout that we all feel. Um, and, you know, just, I think it was yesterday, Panasonic announced they're going to do a four day week in Japan. Um, 
It's wow, just, which in Japan is quite a big deal, isn't it? Yeah, and try, and they said specifically it's to tackle, you know, long hours and burnout culture and to, to mm. try to boost productivity. And I think some of these ideas that you know, one of the big themes in the book is how do ideas go from seeming impossible to seeming inevitable, um, which happened repeatedly throughout history. Um, and I just think we're starting to see that happen with ideas like the four-day week. Um, so I'm, I, if anything, I feel a bit more optimistic <laughs> now than when I than when I publish. Which is a, a worthy outcome of of writing at the very minimum, isn't it? And hopefully, you'll make other people feel more optimistic as well. So I think we I think we need it. I, mean, I think I say um, that if you've just got the kind of anger and the frustration, then it becomes a sort of fatalism. Yeah. Um, and I think you see that with climate change, for example. That yeah, you need kind of anger plus hope is what kind of gets you there and I think um we sort of we've had enough of we've had a lot, a lot of anger but we're sort of missing we're missing the hope I guess yeah the new well the 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 uh, ongoing ideas but getting them entrenched getting their roots down yeah, um like things can be better but like there are ideas out there and think and we can do this I think that's just so important and then one of the bits that I loved is the scene of, um, you know, you're going on your, you know, you're getting away from it, like you, you just sort of spoke about and having that break. Um, and I think, I can't remember, it's somewhere in Scotland, maybe going somewhere remote in Scotland and taking a bunch of books with you. And some of those being historical and sort of feeding that appetite for looking backwards and uh, remembering how far we've come and what big, bold ideas were made possible. And some of them being more the kind of shiny contemporary books um that that many people sort of recommend on this podcast as well so um for our listeners I wondered if you could share a few of each of those that that you think are are useful in terms of keeping ideas uh fresh and helping to shape our thinking as well yeah sure um yeah I got we got into this habit of going going on holidays <laughs> just find the smallest island you can find <laughs> with no internet access um and we went one time to an island called Sande, which is one of the northernmost Orkney Islands, which is wow. just, it's just a wonderful place. How many boats do you have to take to get uh, there? Three boats or something, I don't know. It, I mean, it takes, it must take, I don't know, 18 hours or something. Um, and it's definitely worth it. Um, and I got into this habit yeah, of bringing books about now and about and digital capitalism and books about the Industrial Revolution. Um, and I guess one of the former that I, that I loved is um, a book called Uncanny Valley um, by a woman called Anna Anna Wiener, I think her name is pronounced. Um, and it's a kind of memoir of her time working in Silicon Valley. Wow. Um, and it's <laughs> a brilliant on um, kind of this weird sort of weird vibe and the kind of weird optimising kind of culture that is emerging in Silicon Valley and from all the sort of tech bros. Um, yeah. It's Which really, I think on a on a micro level and talking about vocational learning technology and ed tech, I think even in the last five years I've been doing this podcast, when I started, it was all about optimization, personalization through the lens of education. Like, how can we make people learn things more quickly? Uh, it literally like the grad grind thing of like pouring more things in the jug into the vessel as quickly as you can. Whereas I think it has become more sophisticated about learner motivation and you know keeping that engagement and the the aspect of social learning so I think generally across technology that side has grown up a bit and it's not just about the technocratic solution that you talked about in the beginning and it's more about the behavioral side and going further for longer so that's really that does sound really interesting just becoming a bit more human and 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 like not not coincidentally more diverse and inclusive as well and yeah the same feet, the same old people making, making. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of key. And it, but that, that's a, that's a lovely book. Um, yeah. And then on the historical side, there's this a brilliant book called The Unbound Prometheus by um, an, an economic historian called David Landers, who um, yeah is kind of um, quite well known for this book. And it's um, it's kind of quite a long read, but it's it's one of the best books I've seen for um, capturing that moment of kind of of ignition when the industrial revolution kicked off and it kind of gives you this um amazing sense of what it must have been like to be there at the time and to kind of have this kind of new version of capitalism emerge um and the sort of the sheer disruption that, that played out at the time um so that's also that's a great book and kind of just really interesting to think about all the parallels with the kind of change that we're seeing play out now 
Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so if, if anyone wants to read End States, that is available in all good bookshops, I'm guessing? Yeah, all good bookshops. Yeah, available, <laughs> available now. Um, Both hard, digitally hard. and in physical capacity. And um, yeah, I think I think the message is a great one. You know, I think that among our listeners that are either working within, um, you know, the workplace as the head of L&D or indeed within universities, colleges, schools, um, but also on the entrepreneurial side and the investor side, you know, you've either got that experience of the day-to-day struggles of digital transformation and change management or, um, and, and often these go hand in hand, that 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 kind of necessary horizon gazing and optimism. And I really like that idea of informed optimism. And uh, I think that's a great message to to leave our listeners with. So, Thank you very much, James. And um, what what other work uh, in your with your other hats on should we be aware of? Anything else you want to throw in the ring? Yeah, I think, um, I've just started a new blog, New Year's Resolution. So I'm doing um, I'm writing a weekly blog, also calling it End State, so I just kind of build oh, on brilliant. the book, um, which is about sort of how do we govern the future. So um, if you look on um, Medium or on Substack, um, maybe we can put the links. Um, share the links with folk but um, that's just a kind of weekly blog exploring this kind of question of what come what comes next fantastic we will certainly um, share that in our show notes as well so thank you so much when's your next uh, trip to north scotland yeah i need to book one i've i've failed, <laughs> I've failed throughout um throughout covid and i've just emerged from a long lockdown so i i need to book one for the summer I reckon. brilliant All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing the ideas in your book. And uh, yeah, look forward to following your blog. Thanks so much. Great to speak. That's all for this week. A big thank you to James and to UFI Voctech Trust for this week's episode. I do encourage you to go and read the book. It really does allow us to take a step back from our current pace and reflect on human achievement and what we want next. On that note, do go and check out the UFI Seed Grant Fund call, which can help get your innovation and ideas launched or tested. And applications are being taken until the 9th of February. And if there are other books or authors you'd love to hear from, do drop us a line. You can go to the contact page at theedtechpodcast.com or drop me a line at theedtechpodcast at gmail.com. We'll be back with a podcast chatting to Kevry in a week or so about creating better knowledge exchange solutions. And that's uh, one of our favourite subjects because uh, we just love sharing ideas. So until then, have a great week. Bye bye.